Good evening, everybody. And welcome to this evening's uh, RAU 175 alumni lecture, which is the first uh, uh, alumni lecture that we've done since last year. Um, so we're very pleased to be um, kickstarting again. Um, and I am thrilled to be able to welcome this evening um, recent alumna Fiona Galbraith, um, who graduated in 2018 uh, with an MSc in Rural Estate Management. Um, since leaving the RAU, she's established Rural Link, which is a company linking military talent with land-based employers, um, having had a background in the armed forces, which I'm sure she will um, give us lots of detail about in a moment, um, including uh, serving for 24 years in the army. Uh, we're also delighted to be joined this evening by David Carter, who has been chief executive of City Harvest um, since May last year. Um, he also has a career, a past career in the army um, and then in management consultancy um, and is now working uh, with City Harvest to grow London's uh, surplus food to, um, uh, to feed the people who are facing food poverty at the moment. Uh, so we'll be delighted to hear from both of these um, in just a moment. Um, I must just uh, do a bit of housekeeping. Um, there won't be any fire drills, I hope. These were all sat at home, but if there are, please run around screaming and then leave the building in an orderly fashion. Um, also, I have a two-year-old sat next to me off screen, so if you hear any squeaking, I do apologise. Um, I am bribing him with milk and biscuits at the moment, so hopefully that will work. Um, and then finally, um, we will be taking questions uh, later on in the talk. I am my There you go. Um, and um, if you would like to submit a question, we will take your question live. Um, but if you could type it in the question and answer box, and then we will come to you and let you know when we'd like to hear um, uh, your question directly from you. Um, and then that's it. I hope you have a lovely evening and I'm going to throw over to Fiona and David. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Hannah. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here um, and thanks very much for, for setting this up. Um, I uh, was commissioned into the army um, from the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst in 1995. And as you say, in uh, 2018, I found myself at the Royal Agricultural University and I thought I might tell you a little bit about um, how that journey happened. Um, and uh, we'll see how many of the uh, alumni that resonates with. Um, if you throw your memories back to um, 1995, 1996, um, those of you who were who were around then um, will remember that uh, there was a the breakup of Yugoslavia, and the British Army and many other nations um, were deployed um, in a variety of operations from the United Nations and then as individual nations, um, trying to um, keep the peace. Um, will impose a peace at one stage and then keep the peace. And, and, and how that relates to me is that that was my first operational deployment. And as a young 22 year old, I was uh, in Bosnia and uh, the uh, threat from improvised explosive devices and in fact, mines laid on the road was, uh, was very real. And as a result, um, for the six months I was there, we were never allowed to leave the tarmac. Um, in fact, you know, we didn't really go outside some some small bases, which were, um, in my case, a requisition, reckon, um, requisitioned factory. Um, and so when you moved, if you were on foot, you stayed on tarmac, um, but usually it was in vehicles. And I very much remember um, coming home at the end of that uh, six month tour and um, standing in my parents' garden. Um, they had a small vineyard, but it's just standing in the garden and taking my shoes and socks off and wriggling my feet and my toes in the grass and just feeling the warmth that you get on a summer's day from the soil and the feeling you know, of the grass in between my toes and all that meant about being back in, in England for me. And it was a very, very tactile, visceral experience for me. And I've subsequently served in Cyprus, which is very brown, been in the Middle East, which is very brown, um, and been in a lot of places which are very brown. 
And on each occasion I've come back and there's been some similar experience where I've either been driving or walking and been very struck at the beauty of the natural environment, which of course we all know is very much um, maintained, but the greenery and beauty of our countryside. And so if you fast forward to Stuttgart um, in uh, southern Germany in uh, 1997, uh, sorry, in 2017, when I was serving on exchange with um, a United States um, for, for, uh, for, uh, formation that's actually um, focused on Africa, but it's based in, in Europe. Um, and I started to think about what I would do when I le left the forces. Um, and I was on a coaching course and somebody on that course introduced me to a, a very clever technique that basically has you map your passions against your expertise. And uh, I had that up on a what's called a shrank, which is a big German wardrobe for six months. A whole load of post-its and I was moving them around this shrank, these four different quadrants, which is how this technique works. And they, they were all about what I was good at and what I loved, passion and expertise. And they eventually resolved down to two potential career paths. One was about talent management, people, and one was about the land and went back to this feeling of being embedded in, uh, in my parents' garden in, in southeast Kent. And it took me another six months to work out that actually I could do both. And uh, it's putting both together, the, the people um, and the countryside that has led me to Rural Link. And that's what led me to um, look for a course um, I could do that potentially could lead to a career if my own business um, you know, was only a, a sideshow to that. And so I ended up um, looking at uh, the Royal Agriculture University, which offered um, the best course uh, for me. And I did the, the P course, the MSc in um, Rural Estate Management, which clearly is designed as a vocational course to go into estate management, but actually is as good a survey and uh, introduction um, and upskilling um, sort of at the surface level um, to a wide variety you know, eight, eight modules that look at uh, a whole number of aspects of the way our land and countryside is managed. So that's what I did. And, um, and during that time, I did get a part-time job and then I left that and started um, really focusing on Rural Link. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about Rural Link and what I do, but that's, that's the story. And, um, and, you know, ever since I've had a very um, close link with the Royal Agriculture University and um, with Hannah and her team, who've been very supportive of what Rural Link's been doing with X Forces, and we've we've developed a lot of a lot of initiatives, um, and it's a it's a really good relationship. So that's a bit of an introduction to me, and I probably ought to let David introduce himself, and then we might talk about some of the other things um, that we've been doing and and why you see both of us here together this evening. Super, thank. Thank you, thank you, Fiona. Um, I, I, I've got lots of touch points that match very similar to you. Actually, I'm sure that factory in Bosnia was uh, just. Down, I was in a disused shoe factory at one stage, so I'm sure we're just up the road. Um, so my journey in the military really begins. Uh, I was born and brought up in Wales, in Cardiff, and I joined the Scouts. And I spent a huge amount of time in the Brecon Beacons, the Black Mountains. Um, doing what you do when you're in the, the Scouts and then Duke of Edinburgh's award and that sort of thing. So very much, you know, of the earth, of the, of the soil. And then I went off to university in Dundee, studied biochemistry. And my final six months of a four-year degree were, uh, included a dissertation that I did at the Scottish Crop Research Institute over in Invergarry. And I liquidized over a ton and a half of frozen raspberries to identify one specific protein that's in the cell wall uh, that most people on this call would understand botrytis but you know gray mold and how it's a huge huge effect on the um the economy in soft fruit growers in in tayside and so in my last and, and all the while i'd been at university i joined this thing the officer training corps and got 
it was essentially the scouts, but uh, the, the next movement on from that. And uh, I then in my final summer went for my two week commissioning course at Sandhurst and I became a, a reserve army officer. It was a, the TA, the territorial army then. So I've, I've only ever been for two weeks to Sandhurst and, and done it, most of my sort of career development in two week chunks as a reservist, because whilst I've had my military career, I've also had my other career, the proper career, if you like, the full time thing that pays the mortgage of management consultancy. So I've worked a lot here for PA consulting in big public sector programs uh, and latterly for KPMG. And at periods I've deployed on operations and clearly you, you, know, you don't retain your, your day job, you, you deploy for those six months or in fact to go to Afghanistan for 19 months I was mobilized the preparation and developing a company to go to Afghanistan, the company that deployed for seven months, and then the recovery to, to, to bring them to bring them back. So I've had a nearly 30 years in the army, and I'm actually still a reservist, which is why Fiona and I know each other from, uh, we were both deputy presidents of the Army Officer Selection Board uh, relatively recently, uh, including um, setting up our beekeeping um, in the um, in the wall, beautiful wall garden. If you ever get a chance to go to the Army Officer Selection Board um, in in Westbury, uh, you'll see some bees, and that's courtesy of Fiona and me, and a, a bit of a local project we did there. The bit in the middle between recently being at the Army Officer Selection Board and since commissioning in 1993 is I have always come back to. I'm a great Am I a great gardener? I love gardening. I'm qualified, RHS qualified and various other things. But amongst other things, I set up um, a offshoot of a, a Scottish charity um, called Gardening Leave in the grounds of the Royal Hospital Chelsea. So when I came back from Afghanistan, there was an opportunity of a, a corner of a wall garden at the Royal Hospital Chelsea. Uh, and this charity gardening leave, which would set up in a place called Ochencrove in Scotland, in just outside Ed, um, Edinburgh. And we set up a garden from scratch in the grounds, uh, essentially the disused walled garden in, in the Royal Hospital Chelsea for veterans of, of any service who served one day or, or anything greater. And uh, we had a fantastic time for about two and a half years there before we had to, unfortunately it was, um, like so many things, the, the grounds was or the garden was sold to a Russian oligarch, and so we we move we move the garden across. But that's where I learned a bit more about beekeeping and, and the development design of a garden. So bring this to the reason I'm particularly speaking to you today. Uh, as Hannah said, in May, uh, through the Officers Association, I was working at KPMG. I'd worked there for about nearly two years. Uh, which coincided with sort of towards the end of lockdown. And this fantastic opportunity came up for a, to be chief executive of a local charity. Uh, I would say my main qualification in almost anything is a, being an infantry platoon commander in the Royal Regiment of Wales. Everything else is sort of uh, pales into insignificant. But actually, I, I was very lucky to be the commanding officer of Cambridge University Officer Training Corps and so a similar sized organization in terms of numbers of people turnover and revenue was a charity relatively close to me literally 15 minutes from my house in Acton West London called City Harvest London and the model is that there's a huge amount of food waste specifically in London there's donors and funders who want to support us and we're the bit in the middle, which is a, a depot, 13,000 square feet on a trading estate in Acton and a, with a fleet of 17 sprinter vans and a team of about 55 pushing 60 paid employees and nearly, a, nearly 800 volunteers in the course of a year. We take this waste food, some of it which has to be rescued from New Covent Garden Market, New Spitalfields Market, from donors of all kinds. And we resort it and pick it and pack it and send it off in our vans to um, 350 charities that are across London, who themselves then do something with that food in different homeless charities, hostels, homeless um, shelters, and they use that food to sort of support their charitable aims. So this is why I'm speaking to you today. I am involved in food, um, food waste in particular, but farmers and farming, 
further up the chain in terms of food loss are increasingly an important um, partner to us. And we recently had a visit from RAU, from the Institute of Agricultural Management, um, 15 farmers on that course. And uh, those of you who read Farmers Weekly, you might've seen an article that Joe Stanley, who, who writes, a, who's a great writer, um, and wrote about his visit and, and told exactly, well, the last bit of that story about food waste and how food poverty in London is still, you know, not really scratched the surface. And of course, with um, with what's coming down the line in terms of a number of things that you'll have you constantly read about in terms of a cost of living crisis, a fuel crisis, and various other things, then we think the the need will 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 be there for a long time. I think. I um, when when I was at um. Thanks, David. When I was at the REU, I did my MSc dissertation on the barriers. Um, well, it became about the barriers to service leavers getting into um, the land sector. I, also, I actually focused on the apprenticeship, which was you know, the apprenticeship scheme was changing in this country at the time. But um, it became about barriers, systemic barriers and personal barriers. And uh, in the four years since, I've increasingly focused on coaching individuals, but actually working with um, potential employers in the sector on breaking down those barriers because a lot of recruitment across the country um you know and you've worked with some some you know blue chip companies in your, in your career but a lot of the recruitment is done on the basis that everyone's expected to progress within quite a narrow sector and therefore management level jobs tend to say must have 10 years experience you know relevant experience or so forth and I'm really, really interested in the transferable skills that say, actually, 80% of this job, unacknowledged by the HR department, is about the cultural ability, your people ability, your general management ability. And 20, perhaps a bit more, but 20 to 30% is about sector experience. And for some people, learning a sector when they're in a leadership job might be a real challenge. But I think you and I, from both a regular career and from a reserve career that's paralleled your um, management career, would say that the armed forces generally find learning a new sector um, is something we're really good at. Um, and I just wonder if you'd like to comment on that, and that might bring us into you know, what we're doing about it. Yeah. Um... I think the military can be both wonderful and terrible at this, you know, this whole kind of two and a half, three year posting cycle, you know, um, what we should, the, as in what the military should do, of course, is have experts and um, we should have streams. And instead we have somebody who they always describe the curve, don't they? You know, the first six months, you haven't got a clue. The, in the middle, you're absolutely functioning at the, the, best, the height of your abilities. And then the last six months, you already know your next job. So you're sort of heading off. Um, and, and the reality and cited always in procurement and things, you know, to develop a tank, a warship, a, 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 a plane, you know, you need someone who's committed to that for 10, 15 plus years. Um, so on the, on the positive side, that going in with a new team, getting to know them, getting to trusting them or, and vice versa, being trusted by them. I think that is, is a massively transferable skill that's very difficult to sort of um, be explicit about, but I would think it's implicit. I would hope it's implicit from the military. But if you learn, if you've, you and I have learned nothing from, from applying for various jobs, you've pretty much got to tell somebody either direct in your CV or in your interview. So that's the kind of, from the military side, from the other side, um, I'm, I've told you about warehousing, depots, transport, logistics, and almost everyone will say, oh, of course, it's your military logistic background. And I have greatest, I, I said it, didn't I, you know, infantry platoon commander is the thing in my, in my platoon in Merthyr Tidville, um, age 24 or whatever it was, you know, that's really my main learning experience that I've carried on. It's people and it's always about people. And you can... You can pay a lot of money on tech and kit and various things, but it's the people every single time to, to make the organization work. Um, and the leadership is this great sort of phrase that, you know, sprinkle a bit more leadership on something, but consistently from really pr um, competent and 
competent people there's that moment where they look across and you know you're the person standing on your feet or at the top of the table whatever and, and people want to be led and i think that is not a common trait uh, really in within the civilian sphere yeah when i was when i was setting up um rural Inc, i was looking for some easy handles for people from you know the the armed forces side and um the land-based sector you know agriculture somewhere in the middle of it agriculture and land management probably in the, in the middle of it um, and i was looking for a way to link them together and uh, the armed forces particularly love mnemonics, don't we? I mean, we're, everything's got to have a, an abbreviation that we can remember. And so I picked farmers and I used farmers. Oh. And I used that as a mnemonic to list the, the shared values. Um, and I'm not going to bore everyone going through it, but uh, it's, it's, it's on the website and some people can look at it. But the point was it took me about five minutes to do because the values shared between the armed forces and the land sector and anything practical actually are very similar and it's about you know the f is formable but it's about leadership resilience being a little bit robust being quite pragmatic which didn't quite fit you know but you know those the, you know and, it, and actually the one that that i didn't get in there which farmers said to me a lot when i was researching what i was doing was to, was being presentable and, um, and apparently it's quite difficult to get people who are presentable, but the armed forces turn up on time or five minutes early and they're, they're pretty presentable. Um, yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. And those, those barriers that I found were more actually um, perceived barriers. And as I mean, you've said that you have to sometimes tell people that actually, yeah, can do that. And what I found in what in the work I do is that if I can get someone into the room, they can talk themselves into a job. The problem is getting them into the room. And now that's, you know, and that's where I've become really focused. And as I say, I try and work with with employers um, you know, to, to decode a few things, but also to, you know, to sometimes to sometimes get them to to be less it's a it's a bias it's a type of bias that's informed by popular culture and it's also informed by a charity-led narrative about um victimhood in um our in our veterans which applies um to a, a very small minority i think it's 3.2 percent of uh, of people leaving the forces do so on a medical um discharge that's a very small percentage um, and they do, of course, deserve a lot of help. But um, the the rest of us are are just changing jobs. But we need a little bit of support because, uh, well, I wrote my first CV when I was forty two, as a as a regular army officer. I'd never written one before I was forty two, um, so I now help a lot of people write their CVs. But I'd rather not spend time on CVs. I'd rather build networks, and put personable people with huge capabilities next to employers who want personable people with huge capabilities. And that's that's where I've gone with the you know with with the course we're collaborating on. Let me can I just jump in on that bit? So um, I because I was found this fantastic role by the Officers Association, um, and in fact my role at KPMG to be, uh, actually had had been through an introduction via the Officers Association. Um, I have been to a number of events to sort of I feel I want to return the favour and you're faced with a sea of faces of you know 25 people who are either resettling or about to resettle and they, they, they quite often sort of want to be told the magic answer you know how am I going to get this job uh, and, and they see it as a job and I, I, I turn it on its head usually it's exactly as you're describing it's your profile on LinkedIn it's talking to your friend or a friend of a friend or a keep keep going your network um and i rarely read cvs these days i you know you have to go through a process and they, they must be open and, and absolutely interviews but um the linkedin profile and the recommendation from somebody who he or she is like him or her um yeah if they're saying that person is up to it and is maybe these are maybe some of the development things to think about then that goes infinitely further than beautiful prose on a cv which let's be honest as a chief exec you, you just don't really have much time well you certainly don't have time to do the justice in which it was mm. or give it justice in terms of time in the way it was written probably do you, do you think linkedin is sort of to the individual um 
what a website is to a business. You know, once you've heard about it, you just check it really exists and it sort of does do what you were told it does. Or maybe you remind yourself what you were told it does. And then you sort of go back to the individual or the business, you know, having just checked they exist. I think that's exactly it. We all have our own personal brand, whether we like it or not. And, um, you know, if you undersell yourself, then you, you won't reap the benefit. You've got to be very careful. You know, you don't go too far the other way. And, um, you know, and it's quite a good filtering tool in that because, you know, it's it's public and your mates with whom you've served. You know, if you say you did X, Y and Z, but you did Y and actually not that well, you know, it's I think it's a self sort of filtering tool. And um, so, yeah, I. I, I, shorthand is so much of this is shorthand you know if, if you can't distill down into a couple of sentences what you what you have done and what's the what's the most important thing and relevant thing then you know you, you you're not doing yourself justice i guess i think that's right i am um, the, the, the the timing for this david is of course that you've kindly agreed to come and speak on this course at the reu and uh, mm, we'd love to are presenting in June and um, another opportunity for you to uh, to talk about City Harvest but also to talk about these sort of um, matters and um, I know you've had a chance to look but I might just describe a little bit to um, other people on the call um, we, we're doing a, a, a course that's two weeks um, and it's specifically designed to hit these points that David and I have been talking about to to take people who have 60 to 80 percent of the personal qualities that rural businesses are looking for and to de-risk them a bit in the eyes of the employers by giving them enough experience um, by visiting some businesses some of them led by some very high profile people um, in the industry and putting them in these case studies for a day where they'll have a chance to explore you know, right from food production through to food retail and some land management, some forestry um, and uh, a couple of other bits and pieces in the middle. Um, and have a chance to look at how those businesses work, to ask questions in some cases to understand how the books work um, and just get that real tangible feel, which will give them a bit of confidence um, about having really experienced um, some of these businesses. Um, and also having a few things to talk about that aren't, I hear your question in interview, and let me just apply that to my multi-million pound procurement project of tanks, which uh, is, is, you know, is, is what they have to, to go for at the moment. And what I hope it will inspire um, in people as well is just an, an idea of just how many opportunities there are. Um, but the way we're bringing that course to a close is with two days in which they will attend panels and question and answer sessions with all the businesses that have contributed so there's a real networking opportunity a get to know you opportunity and what I'm my personal goal of course is that you know 10% of the course will uh, will get jobs off the back of it but as you've described it's it's not immediately about jobs it's about finding the right career though for some of them they will definitely be in the business of looking for jobs and having people like um, yourself um, come along and say, well, look, this is how this, this is how this works in reality, and you know, with with greatest respect, if I can do it, so can anyone. Is <laughs> is is really valuable, um, and so I'm really grateful that you're doing that. Um, and I, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about your, because you, you mentioned that you'd done a little bit of um, work with the REU in the last couple of weeks, and just what it was that really chimed um, with the um, the lead the upcoming leaders that were on the course that you spoke to and and what you've gained from that that perhaps will have some value for others um yeah as we as we go along um the, there's always um i i think it, you've said it a number of times but you know there's there's such an obvious synergy between agriculture um in particular farming but agriculture more generally um the, the land-based industries and the military i think just it, it's so obvious and there's just a, a massive mutual respect i think so it was very gratifying which is not a trivial thing in itself when you're a, a charity that's pushed its 
you know, it managed to survive through uh, a pandemic uh, and is now sort of emerging in a cost of living crisis, um, just to have like minded people who work in and of the land produce food and are frustrated that some of it goes to waste or even worse, it, it isn't even harvested in the first place and, it, and is food lost before it even gets off the farm. So there was uh, uh, this massive mutual respect of 17 farmers on the um, RAU Institute of Agriculture Management course who were doing their visit to London as part of their own course and they were going to the Houses of Parliament, they went to various other um, different uh, institutions across across London. And I think it, it was the fact they came into our depot and they saw huge amounts of food. We're talking one and a half million meals per month is distributed through our depot out to charities across London. And there was that that practical aspect that any farmer would have, which is holding a piece of fruit, vegetable or meat or ambient food in a tin and saying, how has this this effort, time, effort, love, goodwill has gone into this food? How could it have, be, have become waste uh, just through the answer is various ways of mismanagement. So there was this massive affinity and a, we're going to do something about it because I think that's the other massive thing which we have in common. We, we're decision makers. We can't just hang around sort of waiting for, dare I say, um, politicians and others to sort of you know, come up with the answer if you're if you're in agriculture the seed has to go in the ground you have to and you've got to you've got to plan ahead likewise for us food has to go out the same day because it, we're up against a, a use by date or a best before date so it was just a very much a mutual respect and a wow i've heard that i've heard this mentioned but actually it is a real tangible practical thing in front of us and there's a solution being offered here we we want to help. And it was very driven by, right, I know I'm going to get in touch with my mate and he's going to do this. And he, with, so the British Growers Association, Country Landowners Association, um, a number of big estates were all represented. And their, their point was, we, did, we heard this, we, we know there's an issue, but it's now real. We can see it in front of us. There was that wanting to do something practical that was such an affinity. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, well, thank think, you. Oh, there we go. There's Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, both. Um, this has been really um, fascinating. Um, and uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of people wanting to ask some questions. Just a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, to stick it in the question and answer box and we'll come to you in turn. Um, but firstly, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say how um, pleased and proud we are to be um, involved with the course that um, Fiona and David are Running at the RAU, um, I think it's a really fantastic opportunity. Um, and to that end, um, we have partnered with a trust, uh, the McRobert Trust, um, to provide two partial scholarships to help fund the cost of anyone wanting to stay to fund their accommodation. So there will be two of those available a year um, at about a thousand pounds each. Um, so um, if you know anybody who is looking to do the course but is worried about the costs, then please do point them in the direction of that. Um, I think it's a really uh, fantastic opportunity. Um, now, I know that my colleague, uh, who is also um, on the call, um, has an interest in the military and is an RAU alum and is bursting to ask you both the question. So I'm going to go to him first, if I may. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Hannah. And also uh, thank you very much to uh, Fiona and David. I really sort of um, found it really engaging and especially as my sort of as Hannah said I'm, I'm quite interested in sort of military history and and uh, still sort of in um sort of running for potentially going into uh Sandhurst as a um in a sort of a non the non-regular but in sort of the, the part-time reservist sort of way um but sort of just to potentially to um sort of start with Fiona for you I know you have touched upon it briefly but sort of what would be the biggest uh sort of challenges that face um forces leaders and you know maybe not just soldiers but for officers alike um, my best friend actually commissions um, this week or th this next week coming and um, he's already thinking about what he's going to do um, in his sort of after his 20 years. What do you think the biggest challenge is for um, service leavers? Well, um, yeah, it's, it's a really I mean, it's a really good point. Lewis. I mean, if, if your friend is is planning for his um, his his uh, fault, what I call a follow on career, 
mm. as he enters his uh, his army career, he is very much in the minority because um, the most um, regular um, forces are people who've decided when they were pre-teens that they wanted to be in the in the armed forces, whichever whichever service they go into. Um, and they clearly have been successful by the fact that they then get into the forces, usually with very little other work experience um, before they go. I mean, I had done a paper round and I think I managed one week stacking the shelves in a supermarket for uh, kick that into touch. Um, that's my that's my work experience before I joined the army. Um, if they need money when they're at uh, university, they probably join the OTC. Um, and so the, the whole experience from, from basically from puberty is, uh, is armed forces related. So, um, and they're not thinking about anything else and they don't have any life experience beyond it. And so the greatest challenge you might think might be the practicalities, but actually it's around identity. Um, in the same way, really, as people who've grown up in a, a farming community or on a, on a family farm, mm -hmm and then move away from it, sometimes struggle with what their identity is. It's a, it's, there are some parallels there. So I think it's about identity. Then there are the practicalities. I mentioned I hadn't written a CV for the first 25 mm. years of my career. Um, and uh, you know, Dave and I both talked about how useless CVs are really, but we're still all required to do them. Um, so that's a practical skill. Doing an interview. I mean, my first interview was when I was 15 years old which is when I was accepted into Sandhurst. I didn't go till a few years later, you'd be pleased to know. Um, but it was 15 when I was interviewed for that. And my next interview was when I was 45. So, uh, you know, that's, that's quite a, it's quite a gap. So it's about identity. Um, and in order to help people get over that, um, they need to have, feel the confidence um, and feel that they have credibility in whatever environment it is. Um, and that's, and that's where, um, these experiences, that's where businesses like Rural Link are useful um, in that people can come to us, talk about whether this is a sector that's useful for them, what sort of roles they have, what sort of transferable skills they have. And then, you know, I am all about giving people experiences so that they feel confident um, in that sector. They feel confident when talking to people. They can bring their you know, personalities to bear. Um, but do so um, in a way that um, that, that chimes um, with the audience. Um, one of the other things that uh, can sometimes not put people in the best position is in the armed forces, um, although we all have our various bits of expertise, um, the, the focus really every year is about whether you're going to get promoted or not. It's about your ability to lead and what the next leadership thing is. Um, and so the idea of um, perhaps not being promoted this year is a bit alien. Um, and so trying to shift that focus to looking backwards and saying, I was the youngest this rank in my cohort. I was the most successful and looking backwards all the time and trying to help people look forwards um, is, a, is another challenge. I don't know what you think, David, slightly different perspective with a reserve career. Not such a cliff edge, but probably quite similar. I, be beautiful answers, uh, we, all of which I totally agree. Um, I almost sounds like a sort of army recruiting video, but confidence, I think. Um, confidence without overconfidence, as in being overly confident, because sometimes I think some some military people can come across as slightly too full on. But it's, um, I think it's the working out the culture of the sector, industry, uh, maybe individual organization or business into which you want to move and working out, you know, do you have the EQ or just um, leadership style and flexibility to, to adapt to that? Um, and I'm, I'm in two kinds in, uh, of ways of thinking of it, I would say. One is, you know, is it the right sector and or organization for you? And it's not it's not failure if it isn't, you know, you should you, you a bit like trying to join a regiment or an arm or a service, you know, if you move into the wrong one, you, you'd be pretty miserable and it's not right for you. Um, however, my second part is there's often um, there's not one right answer. 
So there's any number of opportunities which would be absolutely brilliant and fulfilling. And I think it's just sort of embrace it, be, be confident and embrace it because um, our, our adaptability from the military, I think is one of our greatest assets. My point about, you know, you, you get posted in for somewhere for two and a half to three years, you've got to make a difference. And the vast majority of people do. It's just normal. Yeah, yeah, really adaptable. Adaptability, I think, is is hugely valid. Mm-hmm. Lewis, does that does that hit your does that it, hit it, your question? Anything it, else? It, it does. Thank you. And actually, um, well, while uh, sort of uh, David's still on my screen, which you could start and then hand over to you, uh, Fiona, for this one. But is there any more that um, sort of rural employers, not just agriculture, but sort of um, employers in land based industries, um, do to make their businesses more attractive for um, some service leaders? Yeah, I think um, I think there is definitely. Thanks. Um, there's um, the the I have dealt with a lot of businesses who have either seen the website I've put up or they've heard me speak at something like this, and they instantly get in touch and say, "Can you help me find whatever? Yeah, you know, I need a relief." you know milka i need a this i need a that and i'm like yeah okay well i'm very happy i can put that up as an advertisement job ad on the website for a month or so if you like um but then they don't follow up with any information about it um and and they and they they don't have they don't provide me with information about the business they don't perhaps provide me with what they're going to do for the individual um and what service leavers are looking for leaving the regular forces is a complete change in their life they're changing everything they're changing where they're based their place they're changing the profession there is from defense to in this case you know whichever of the land-based um industries we're talking about and they may be changing their position the level at which they're working you know from something where they consider themselves to be a leader to somewhere where they're probably doing something that's more technical or they're learning. They may be bringing, coming across at the management level, but they're changing what I call the three Ps, place, profession, and position, all at the same time, usually, um, which is quite a high risk. And so if an employer wants to attract someone who's going through such a fundamental change in their life, and so is their spouse, and so are their children, everyone is being you everyone is having a huge shock to their way of life um then really they do need a bit of support that's not to mean they need to be molly coddled but they need to be given reliable information they need to be told we can help you with accommodation by which we mean a caravan and probably don't bring the kids or by which we mean we'll introduce you to someone who rents cottages in the village for a reasonable rate for six months whilst you settle those little things which do have a cost tag and a time tag associated with them, they'll then reap the benefit in, of course, because those majority of service leavers are looking for stability. They're looking for investment. They're looking to give of themselves. And what they demand in return really is a little bit of leadership and a little bit of um, you know, the leadership they're used to, which is um, without getting too preachy about it either, but the, the Sandhurst motto is serve to lead and the type of leadership that service people are used to is the type of leadership that says I care about you how can I make your life easier in the sure knowledge that if I as a leader make your life easier you're going to pay me back in in droves Um, and if we don't if we don't see that people then go somewhere else that does offer that there's um there was a report done um last year by um at Exeter University that talked about some of the barriers for to people tra- transferring into um agriculture particularly and uh, and I'm one of the you know I was interviewed for that and I found that very interesting and it talked about exactly these points it's not just me saying it <laughs> so there's some good academic research that says the same Thank you, Annette. Well, it's always good to have a academic, but also real life uh, sort of research as well, isn't it? So, um, yeah. and and David, what, what for you? What would you think sort of um, land based employers or and rural employers? Um, for for me, it's um, and again, I would 
would largely, you know, I would totally agree with what Fiona just said, but um, it's accessibility because sometimes these, these roles are quite abstract. You know, there's the sort of butcher, baker, candlestick maker sort of view of the world. And it's what are all these roles? You know, you, almost anyone in the military can do almost any one of them, given a bit of time and development and, and support. But how do you get to them? Where are they? So I think that 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 is an issue, and that's of course why you know the the the, the value and the beauty of rural link. And just to, to echo really Fiona's point, it's this difference between um, people are coming from the military, and it's the job and career issue of just you know are you a resource to fill a gap? Well, actually, if you embrace the person the service lever in the right way they will give of themselves a hundredfold but we are often coming from a very vocational well, oh, def definitely from a very vocational background um and at its worst you would say that's institutionalized but at its best you're saying which the rural community does embrace this person bring them into the community and you know you you you, you will collectively reap the benefits yeah Yeah. Great. Um, any more for any more, <laughs> Hannah? Uh, yeah, we do have a um, some a shy little Violet in the questions who wanted me to ask the question on their behalf. Uh, so I will do so. And that was um, we're obviously um, seeing a lot on the mo uh, on the news at the moment about climate change and. Uh, amongst many other uh, crises, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and clearly that's going to change rural industry as a whole. Um, from a sort of, uh, looking at it from a sort of military logistics point of view, I'm not taking this very well, I'm paraphrasing the question, so apologize, apologize to the question asker. Um, from a sort of looking at it from a, a military background, what sort of specific um, insight do you think that uh, members of the forces can bring to that conversation from perhaps their worldwide tours and that sort of thing? Do you want to hit that, David, or shall I, uh, shall I go first? Well, well, why don't I go first? Because I always say I just agree with you and then sort of... Um, so I, I would say perspective. Um, we, you know, um, anyone from the military has this wonderful opportunity to sort of look down their nose at the, the email that goes around the office to say, there's a crisis, you know, the, a printer has run out of its, uh, its printer cartridge. And you're like thinking, well, no, I've seen a crisis, a genuine crisis, and I know what is an emergency and th this ain't it. So you do have to be careful, but equally just a sense of perspective that this, this will pass uh, and We've just come through a COVID pandemic. You know, there were definitely moments where we thought, wow, would life ever be the same? It's different and we've adapted and the human species is very um, robust and we, we, we might not evolve, but collect collectively and conceptually we evolved. So I think that we, we will just move into a new phase. Um, and because of the cycles of agriculture, being seasonal uh, and annual, then you know we're a, that, that's a, an organ, you know a, a sector that will evolve uh, probably quicker than the rest of society. So, I whilst um, agriculture and, and the rural um, economy is at the forefront, it's also evolved it got this ability and a huge you know a, ma many millennia of, of evolving. So it's it's part of normal, I would say. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I, 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 of course, Dave, return the favour of agreeing with everything you said. Um, I, I'd also add that I think that a lot of service leavers and the type of people who serve in the armed forces as regular reserves are driven people who like a passion, who want to be really involved in something. And it's, it's almost vocational. And when they leave one set of you know, passion-driven, values-driven work, they want to work in something else that's passion driven. And I, I, you know, I hazard a guess that one of the attractions of your role, David, is that it has a genuine passion and purpose. You're doing good, good in the world. And I have found in the last few months, as we've come out of lockdown, that um, about 50 percent of the people who contact me and I get service leavers contacting me, um, you know, not quite daily, but every week um, for advice or, or a bit of a steer. 
and about half of them now are talking about sustainability, climate change, ground up, you know, food localization, those sort of issues, things that they didn't have the words for two and a half years ago, but also didn't realize that that, that, that was a thing. And of course, society's narrative has moved on. So I think having a, a goal, a passion, a, a wanting to make a difference is a huge driver for service leavers. Um, and you know, we saw it actually at the beginning of lockdown where a lot of um, people who helped set up community-based projects, um, not all of them, obviously, there's a lot of very capable people, but a lot of service people got involved in setting up community projects that hadn't previously um, existed. The other thing um, that they have once they've got this passion and this drive is that service personnel are taught mechanisms for thinking, for planning, for pulling everything together, doing what we call an estimate, you know, what are all the factors, have a quick think, we've got mechanisms that have become ingrained because we've been taught them at, at all ranks um, to do a little estimate and then come up with a solution. Might not be a perfect solution, but it's something that gets us started. And I think that's why service personnel have a reputation for just getting stuff done. Whether or not they get stuff done, depends on the individual but it certainly gets stuff started um and that's a considerable um, advantage oh thank you very much um fiona um would you just like to say a little bit more about how people can find out about um the course and about yourself yeah of course um so um thank you we it's a rural link um, and what I'll do Hannah if you don't mind is I'll just turn my camera off because my for a moment whilst I'm talking because my screensaver is a QR code which links to the links to the business so that probably is as effective as anything um, so rural link and rural link veteran um, they um, th this is a business that specifically works in that space between service leavers potential employers in the rural sector um, and with educational and training establishments that can support them. And the course that we're running um, in June with the RAU operates specifically in that space. And um, I've put it, I'll put it in the, um, in the chat as well, um, the links to get to that. Um, there's a courses page um, on the Rural Link website um, and the information is there. It's also in the short courses section on the Royal Agriculture University's website. So you can go to it by either route um, and the information is, is obviously the same on both sides. It's a, it's a partnership on that course. Um, so I'll, un I'll uncloak myself again. Um, but that's where the information is. And uh, of course, if anybody's got any questions, um, they're very, very um, welcome to get hold of me and ask those questions. Thank you very much, Fiona. And I'm going to extend the same courtesy to David. Uh, David, how can people find out more about City Harvest if they would like to? Um, this is one of those uh, CEO moments where you hope that the uh, marketing campaign works. But uh, our name, uh, there, there is a City Harvest. We are City Harvest London. And we were um, created because three Wall Street bankers who'd worked in New York had come across City Harvest New York, which is nearly 35 years old. We are um, seven years old. So have a look, uh, Google City Harvest London, and you should, should be able to find us. We're actually cityharvest.org.uk. But uh, please, please find anything uh, uh, you want about us. The two things we always need are more food, i.e. if it's going to waste and you're saying anaerobic digestion, dare I say animal feed, let's have it for the purpose it was made for, the point about climate change, then, you know, the water, the investment in energy and time and, and just farmers' efforts. We, we, would, we would like to have it first dibs for, for people to eat. So send us food, send us money if you like, but cityharvest.org.uk. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much to everyone for coming. Um, all that remains for me to say is hope that everybody has a good rest of their evening and we'll see you again soon at our next uh, alumni lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>